Good morning. You ready to go? All right. How many of you have already taken care of your April 15th obligation? Oh, a lot of people putting it off just like me. Who likes to pay taxes? Anybody in here like to pay taxes? No one. Hmm. I want you to think about it that as we study this lesson. And I'm going to pick on Nick and, and Ronnie this morning. And Ronnie, you get to be the bad guy. Sorry. I want you to imagine a scenario <coughs> three years from now, the United States has completely fallen economically. And China has taken over this country. They've decided that the IRS is not an effective means of getting your money to support their government. So, they begin from our own people taking bids. People uh, like Ronnie have decided that he can earn a living by working for the government of China. I mean, they're here. He's got to have a job. So Ronnie puts in a bid collect taxes for the county of Putnam. So, Ronnie sets up shop. The junction of 136 and Highway 5. Parks his booth, his table right in the middle of the highway. And everyone that comes by that junction is subject to getting out their billfold and paying Ronnie or the government of China their due. Now, Donnie, Ronnie's bid has, has been extravagant, and he's won it from several other bidders. And the way he makes his living is to get more than what he bid to the government of China. And that extra goes in his pocket. So along comes Nick. Nick's just harvested his crops this last fall, and it was a bountiful harvest. So Ronnie asked Nick to get out his checkbook. And he taxes him for his crop. He's driving a nice Dodge pickup with diesel motor. So much money there. And it goes on and on and on. And pretty soon, Nick says, I'm not going to pay you anymore. Well, what Nick doesn't know is Ronnie has Doug and Jim hired as thugs. And they take his arm and twist it behind his back until he does pay. And this goes on and on and on, and Nick's at the junction quite a while. Ronnie's going to get it all from him. Nick's out of money. I can't pay you anymore. He says, well, you still owe me taxes on all your land. I, I don't have any more money to pay you. So he has to sign over his deed to his land. Still owes more taxes. Nick can't pay. Ronnie says, that's fine. I'll take Connie. She'll work. And if you don't like it, we we'll throw you in jail. Just how it works. Okay? So how many people like our assessor, Mr. Roof, the publican? Not many. You know, not only, not only does he have the authority of his office, but he has big men supporting him with the heavy muscle. And he's got the government behind him. And there's nothing you can do except pay the man. Nothing you can do except pay the man. Ronnie's Christian, right? He's one of us. And he's working for the Chinese government, collecting taxes. And he's been doing it long enough now that he's figured out ways how to make that excess that go in his pocket even greater. So he cheats a little, fudges a little. I mean, you know what happens when you start to make money? There's, there's not enough. You've got to have more. Is Ronnie any longer a privileged member of the Parkview Church of Christ? Do we even let him in the door? Knowing that he's stealing from us our pockets our hard-earned money, and giving it to a government that has their thumb down on us and we can't do anything but pay the piper? Do we welcome him into the house of God this morning? Turn to the book of Luke, chapter 5. I'm going to read a gospel harmony for you as I did last week. 
And just to remind you where we're at in the life of Christ, Jesus is continuing in His ministry. We're about a year, a year and a half into Jesus' ministry in the region of Galilee. His home base is in Capernaum. What you need to know about Capernaum being right on the Sea of Galilee, there were a lot of taxes to collect from the fishing industry, from boats, from people passing by the shore. This is a great trade route. It was right along the edge of Palestine, right along the Jordan River, all kinds of traffic. Matthew has set up shop right here. Okay? And that's where we're at. This is the call of Matthew. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to Him. And He began to teach them. As He walked along, He saw Levi, or Matthew, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow Me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything. King James says He forsook forsake forsaked everything, and followed Him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others, as Luke says, the other two Gospels say sinners. It's, that's nice of Luke to say others. You know, he's among the Gentiles. He's not in, so he's favorable to everyone. They were eating with Him, and His disciples were there eating with them, and there were many who followed him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect, that would have been the scribes, saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, and they complained to his disciples. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew, Levi is quite a character. We talked about this morning, we gave an example of, of Ronnie being a publican in the county of Putnam. Levi, or Matthew, was the one who won the bidding opportunity in the region of Capernaum. Okay? He worked directly for the Roman Empire. He was a Jew, Levi. He was from the tribe of Levi. He was what they call a publican. That's the lump name for all types of publicans, and there are many. The Hebrew word for tax collector is mokes. That's what Matthew was. He was a moke. He was a small moke. Because he sat at a booth. A great moke would go around and had several people that worked for him and with him and would knock on your door and collect taxes right at your door. And these moques worked for a, a man who, say, had bid the whole region of Palestine. And there may have been 20 or even hundreds of moques in the region of Palestine. But Matthew's one of them. The Talmud charges them, these moques, with gross partiality, remitting in the case of those whom they wish to show favor and exacting from those who were not their favorite. So it worked like this. Ronnie sees Nick, a lot of possibility of dough. He sees somebody else driving an old beat up Ford and there's nothing to get there. Go on your way, sir. He picks on those that he wants to pick on. And he shows favoritism to those that he wants to show favoritism to. He's not honest. He's not consistent. They hate his guts. Mark Moore says that the Jews simply hated this oppressive system of Roman taxation. They hated the high percentage of taxes. They hated the sheer number of different taxes. There were poles. There were bridges, roads, harbors, income, town, grain, wine, fish, fruit, etc. It goes on and on and on. Anything they wanted to tax, they could. Nothing was off limits. The Roman government says, get all you can, however you can. And whatever you get over your bid, yours. They hated how their money was spent on immoral and idolatrous activities. 
They saw how these tax collectors lived it up. They hated them for it. They saw how the money supplied the Roman legion that made them carry their packs a mile. And Jesus says, take it too. They hated everything their money was going to. But most of all, they hated what the Roman taxation represented. Roman domination over the people of God. The Jews wanted a theocracy. They wanted the line of David to rule over them. But they've got Caesar instead. Alfred Edersheim writes, We don't know much, or we know much, and yet as regards details, perhaps too little about those, tolls, dues, and customs, which made the Roman administration such sore and vexatious exaction to all provincials, and which in Judea loaded the very name of publican with contempt and hatred. They who cherished the gravest religious doubt as to the lawful of paying any tribute to Caesar as involving in principle recognition of bondage to which they would fain have closed their eyes and the substitution of heathen kingship for that of Jehovah must have looked on the publican as the very embodiment of anti-nationalism. Basically what he says there, their money was supposed to go to God. And yet it was going to an idolatrous government that was outside the kingdom of God. It is to this that the rabbis so often refer. Now listen closely. If publicans were disqualified from being witnesses and judges, it was, at least so far as regarded witness-bearing, because they exacted more than was due. Hence, also it was said that repentance was especially difficult for tax collectors and customs house officers. Repentance. You need to understand repentance meant so much more to the rabbinic system than it does to Christianity. Repentance, as in a works right, righteousness, to show your penitence, was more important than receiving mercy or giving mercy. Publicans were such low lowlifes and so defiled that the rabbinic system taught that they could never repent. It couldn't happen. They were so evil, they weren't capable of repentance. They weren't capable of the forgiveness of sin. And this is what this passage is all about. Just like last week. This is all about Jesus' authority to forgive sin regardless of what state of sin you're in. It doesn't matter how you come to Him, just that you come. When He says, follow Me, He doesn't care about your baggage. Your baggage means nothing to Him because He is so much higher and greater than anything you're carrying. And just as Matthew, we should drop it and follow Him. I want to read you a little more about this importance of rabbinism. This is directly from Alfred Edersheim. As righteousness came by the law, so also return to it on the part of the sinner. Hence, although rabbinism had no welcome to the sinner, it was unceasing in its call to repentance and extolling its merits. You see, they heap the burdens on you, but you could never achieve it. You weren't righteous. The last pages of the tractate on the Day of Atonement are full of praises of repentance. It not only averted punishment and prolonged life, but brought good, even the final redemption to Israel and the world at large. It surpassed the observance of all the commandments. Can you believe that? That's what they thought. That's what they thought. Repentance surpassed the observance of all the commandments and was meritorious as if one had restored the temple and altar and offered all sacrifices. Stay with me. One hour of penitence and good works outweighed the whole world to come. One hour 
of penitence and good works outweighed the whole world to come. That was the Pharisees' view. These are only a few of the extravagant statements by which rabbinism extolled repentance. But when more closely examined, we find that this repentance as preceding the free welcome of invitation to the sinner was only another form of works righteousness. It was how you looked on the outside that mattered. The length of your phylacteries. It didn't matter what was in here. The vital difference between, this is again more from Edersheim, but the vital difference between Rabbinism and the Gospels lies in this. Jesus Christ freely invited all sinners, whatever their past, assuring them welcome and grace. The last word of Rabbinism is only despair and a kind of pessimism because you can never get there. You're not righteous. We'll keep the burdens on you. You'll never achieve it. Only we have the answers. Only we have the power. For it is expressly and repeatedly declared in the case of certain sins and characteristically, characteristically of heresy of which Matthew was guilty of, working for the Roman government, that even if a man genuinely and truly repented, he must expect immediately to die. Indeed, his death would be the evidence that his repentance was genuine. Since, though such a sinner might turn from his evil, it would be impossible for him, if he lived, to lay hold on the good and to do it. Can you see now why Jesus called them a brood of vipers? Why they were making them twice the sons of hell that they were? It wasn't that they hated Him. It was that He hated what they were teaching. It was contrary to what God wanted. So what would have the rabbis of the day thought of Matthew, taxes and tax collectors, specifically the people? What would they thought of them? They thought they were part of that group that could never, ever earn repentance. And Matthew was a Jew among them. What a traitor. What a Benedict Arnold. What a Judas Iscariot Matthew was. You think Jesus and His disciples had any familiarity with Matthew? You think Matthew knew who they were? Look at the map. Sea of Galilee, four fishermen called. You know that Peter hated his guts. Every time he came in, there was Matthew. How many fish did you catch today, Peter, old boy? Licking his lips. Now remember, Jesus has been ministering in Galilee. Matthew's had ample opportunity to hear Christ's message, to hear his preaching. I like Mark Moore. He thinks he's a closet Christian just waiting for an opportunity to jump at the opportunity to rid himself of sin. He knows all about taxation. The disciples know all about taxation. He knows all about the preaching of Christ and the signs of Christ. Who can repent? Who receives mercy? Jesus comes by. Peter is likely a step ahead trying to avoid even looking at Matthew. And he hears, follow me. What? Not him. They wouldn't want anybody like him, but specifically him. The Pharisees follow Jesus and the disciples and Matthew to His home. A home that no doubt the disciples had been past, probably thrown rocks at. They probably yelled out curses at Him from the road as they walked by. They hated His guts. I can't emphasize that enough. 
But Jesus, Jesus has a different view of Matthew. He sees into Matthew's heart. Just like he sees into our hearts. Matthew's attitude from the command to follow me, we may have the idea that Matthew jumped up, just dropped all the cash and left. Likely that's not what happened. Likely he closed up shop and followed Jesus. But you need to understand something. There were all kinds of sharks waiting in the wake for Matthew's job. Peter, the sons of thunder, they've got Zebedee and the servants behind to continue the fishing business while they're gone. Matthew, when he leaves, he leaves everything. His whole life is in Jesus' hands now. He leaves everything to follow Christ. And he's so excited. He's so excited about following Christ, he holds a feast in his honor. And who's invited to the party? Think about it. Think about people you know who have come to Christ, been baptized, and they're excited. And oftentimes we celebrate that day with them. And who comes to the party? Relatives, friends, right? Right? Who comes to Matthew's party? His friends. Oh my. Who do tax collectors hang out with since everybody hates their guts? Other tax collectors. Women that tax collectors like. All the stuff's there. No wonder when Jesus shows up and hangs out with them that the Pharisees call him friends of sinners. He is a friend of sinners. And, and they hate it. They hate it so bad that they play a dirty trick on him. Instead of going directly to Jesus and say, why are you eating with them? They go to the, to the disciples. But why is your master reclining at the table with sinners and tax collectors? This has got to be terribly hard on the disciples. Well, let me explain this. The disciples still have a ton of respect for the Pharisees. All their lives, the Pharisees have been the Jewish laymen who have taught in the synagogues. They're the men who, who knew Scripture, who taught them Sunday school. They revered the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are saying, are you sure you want to follow this guy? He's eating with sinners and tax collectors. That's, that's what you want to follow? You think they doubted a little bit? You think they were hesitant to even go into Matthew's house? They were. No doubt they were. They were men just like Elijah, just like us. They went in, but the Pharisees tried really hard. The disciples were anxious. They would have had doubts. And the Pharisees are playing on their insecurity. But Jesus is comfortable with them. He's extended through this call to Matthew the forgiveness of sin, allowing him to repent, allowing him to receive mercy. And he's the greatest of sinners in the view of all around Galilee. How does this apply to us? How do we take this passage and, and make it stick for us? We're, we're friends with everybody, right? Think about that a little bit. Mark Moore, in his video sermon, uses a couple analogies that are fantastic. The first one is Jesus in the box. We want to be next to Jesus in the box. As close to the center as we can get. Safe from all the walls of the outside. We want, to, we want to be in church on Sunday with Jesus in the box and with our fellow Christians in the center where we're safe and secure. We want to be with Jesus in the box on Sunday night if we're really good Christians. 
And then we want to be with Jesus in the box if we really want to be good Christians on Wednesday night Bible study. And stay right there in the center, close to Jesus. It's kind of similar to the Jews wanting to wear their phylacteries. Kind of similar to the Jews fasting. It's kind of similar to the Jews keeping the Sabbath. Staying ritually clean. We stay in the center. We don't have to be around. We stay in the center. We don't have to be around the centers, right? If we stay tight with one another, we can stay religiously clean and be accepted by Jesus, right? And that's what He wants us to do, right? No. Not at all. But we do avoid sin by avoiding the sinner. We're all in the habit of doing that. You have to be honest with yourself. There are people that you don't want to hang with. I know it's true because it's true for me. They make me uncomfortable. They take me down a road to the past where I once was that I want to forget about. To be associated with them makes you all think that I'm probably committing some sin. I'm the preacher, right? I can't possibly go down and play golf at the country club anymore, can I? Or go in the clubhouse? They serve alcohol in there. The first time I preached, there were about a dozen couples from the country club that came and heard me preach. Some of them hadn't been in church for years. You never know who's ready. You ever had a beach ball fall into the pool and you didn't have your swimsuit on and you needed that beach ball so you're reaching out as far as you can to grab it but you don't want to get wet, right? We've got to get outside the walls, folks. We've got to reach beyond the walls. You know, we either dive in and get wet, or we just plain get out of the pool. One or the other. That's my challenge to you this morning. If you've heard nothing else, hear that Jesus is a friend of sinners. And if He can be a friend of sinners, so can we. I'm not telling you to go and sin, or to... <laughs> Put yourself in a compromising position that you can't handle. I'm not asking that. This comes along the lines of showing love to those who hate you. This comes along the lines of showing love to those who don't deserve love. Getting your hands dirty. That's what this is about. Sowing seed. We can't go out and till our garden up and prepare the soil and plant the seed and expect not to get a little dirty, can we? No. And that dirt washes off, does it not? We're not contaminated. Doesn't Christ's blood wash us clean? Doesn't it protect us? Doesn't it sanctify us? For not only this lifetime, but for all eternity. I think we limit the ability of Christ to make us clean. And we try to keep ourselves too clean. Christ's ability to forgive sin is so much higher and greater than ours. So why can't we show mercy and forgive? to those that are unmerciful and unforgivable. They might just be a Matthew waiting for the opportunity to be called to Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for Your Word. Father, we love the truth that it speaks into our lives. Father, I ask for forgiveness when we don't Take your word to heart. When we just glance over it, 
and read it as if it were some novel. Father, help us to glean the truth in our minds, but apply it to our heart so that it affects every part of our body, so that we're given spiritual energy to leave this place and go seek out those Matthews, to ask them to follow as we follow, to be examples of compassion and mercy and forgiveness in our community. And fathers, to be examples of living repentance. We know we're hypocrites. Everyone knows we're hypocrites. Why try to fool anybody by living self-righteously when we're not righteous at all? We're only righteous because You've made us that way. We're only saints because You've called us that. Father, I'm so grateful for all, all these saints here this morning. I would ask that You bless them, prosper them, challenge them. Father, Lay opportunities in front of them that they can't disregard as coincidence. Holy Spirit, give them the courage and the wisdom and the words they need to share their testimony, to share the truth. God, I pray, pray for a blessing on this church body that we might be, ex that we might be exceptional stewards of the gospel we might be exceptional stewards of the mercy that You've shown us. Father, bless these kids that are here this morning. May we be living examples to them by what we say and what we do, how we encourage them, how we instruct them. Father, I'm so grateful for these willing workers here this morning. Continue to challenge us, Father. Continue to press us. And yes, Father, continue to humble us. We know that all these things are possible through Christ. It's in His name we pray. Amen. We're done, guys.